Hello and welcome to this interview here on France 24. I have the pleasure of being joined uh, by a three-time gold medalist and now the president of the Paris 2024 Olympic Games Organizing Committee, Tony Estanguet. Thanks so much for joining us. How are you feeling? It's one year ahead of the Olympic Games. Your immediate feelings right now? Ah, it's fantastic, of course. I can't wait to be uh, in one year time in, uh, at the same place. Uh, it will be the opening ceremony and, and for, for sure for us it's, it's great. We've been in this journey, fantastic journey for now uh, multiple years and, uh, and so far so good. So uh, really uh, I think it's, it's really important for us to enter in this uh, final uh, stage. Now it is the final stage. We are here on a boat on the Seine River. Uh, it's going to be a monumental occasion, the opening ceremony. What gave you the idea uh, to take that opening ceremony outside of the stadium and into the heart of the city? You know, uh, the games in France are, are very rare. Huh? It's uh, once every uh, centenary. So uh, definitely we wanted to, to offer the best of France uh, to the games. We, we believe that uh, this is also very important to reinvent a little bit the games and, uh, and demonstrate that Paris uh, can really offer uh, a, an unforgettable uh, games. So the opening ceremony is very important because this is the first moment of the games and people have to understand what will be the signature of, of, of those games of Paris 2024. So so to uh, welcome the, the athletes from the, around the world uh, in these conditions uh, with the, this iconic backdrop is for us uh, the best solution uh, to make those games unforgettable. And they're going to be passing on these boats here on the Seine, about 40 of them. Uh, how have recent tests gone? It's very important for us because one billion people will watch this, uh, this ceremony. So, uh, of course, we, we already started to test ourselves. Uh, so far, it's very interesting. It's, there is a great coordination uh, between uh, the public authorities, the state, the city and, and the organizing committee. Uh, we made a first test uh, last week with uh, 60 boats. So there will be uh, more than 100 uh, next year. So it will be uh, another stage, but, but definitely so far, we demonstrated that this is feasible, this is uh, fantastic also uh, in terms of experience for the athletes and for the broadcast. So uh, really, you have to be prepared for a great ceremony. And obviously, with so many people descending on Paris, security is, of course, going to be a big concern. How confident are you that you can uh, prepare ahead of time? Definitely security is the top priority and we, we started to work on it uh, in 2020 and uh, it will be an unprecedented uh, system put in place uh, for this uh, opening ceremony and for the games more largely. Uh, there is an expertise in France, uh, you know, every year we, we, we organize uh, uh, events uh, for the National Day, for the, the New Year, uh, La Nuit Blanche, with millions of people into the streets celebrating. So. It's really important to find the, the best balance to offer again this kind of unique uh, moment of, uh, of joy, of uh, uh, yeah, it has to be the best celebration and, and definitely the, the security will be the priority. So when we make a decision, we, we know that this is feasible in terms of security. It will be an unprecedented uh, number of people of security uh, here in Paris for the Games and it will be probably the, the safest uh, place in the world in terms of security. Well, many people coming to Paris will want to know that because obviously we've had recent riots, we've had those uh, pension reform protests. How can you guarantee uh, to people that they won't be facing any obstacles? Again, I think the, what is really important uh, to relay as a message is the fact that uh, there is a very strong strategy in terms of security for the games like never before. And there is an international coordination also. Uh, and uh, what happened recently in our country uh, uh, doesn't fit at all with, uh, the, the, again, the number of people of security that will be engaged and involved uh, to secure the game. So, it will be completely different and, and there is an expertise, so, um, so we have to be confident. Now obviously with over a million spectators, uh, transport is going to be a big issue. I myself have found it sometimes a bit difficult. How can you uh, basically sort out uh, those transport issues for so many people descending on such a small space like Paris? Yeah, transport is key and we know it also at every game. So. Uh Again, I think it's important also to, uh, to, to say and re-say that uh, there is a, a very effective public transport system in, in, in Paris with uh, multiple lines in every 
venues, competition venues. We will have a transport system put in place to the spectators. Uh, also for the athletes, there will be a specific lane, very secured. So today we, we work on, on, on this point of transport and security for now many years. Uh, there is a, a very uh, uh, image of in details of what we still have to reinforce in the coming years. Uh, recently, we uh, we said that we had two sessions out of the 700 sessions uh, of sport where we we pro potentially have a, a necessity to reinforce a little bit the the, the system. So it's it's very uh, few uh, compared to what happened in the past. So. Again, there is an unprecedented energy. Uh, the state is very fully engaged in, in the success of the game. So I'm sure that the, the experience will be very positive. And now let's talk about ticketing, because obviously we started with the first round. A lot of uh, people found it a little bit upsetting that uh, you had to get three events. But then the second round came along, uh, base tickets at 24 euros. Uh, how do you feel the communication was uh, by the organizing committee? Do you think that there could have been something better done? I think it's difficult to have a, a very positive communication when you have on one side uh, 13 million uh, tickets to sell uh, and on the other side you, are, you have millions more people that would love to have a ticket. So we, there is a, a, a difficulty to match uh, the level of expectations we, we receive uh, uh, ticket purchase from 178 countries around the world and that was the first time uh, obviously that we, we opened the, the ticket sale at the same time in the world and it's fantastic also to have these games wide open also in terms of ticketing. So for us it, it's been a, a huge success. In a few weeks we sold 7 million tickets. It's, it's in precedent and, and it's great because we feel this enthusiasm of people wanting to be part of those games. But on the other side, we are also to accept that millions of people will not have access to the games. And it's a pity it's like this. Uh, we cannot uh, enlarge uh, the capacity in, in terms of ticketing. But the good point is that we, we had a good balance also in terms of prices. Uh, half of the tickets are under 50 euro. 10% uh, of the tickets are over 200 euro. It's more or less uh, the same framework than uh, in the past editions of the games. Of course, there, there will be some disappointment, but, uh, but there are also millions of people who have access to the games and, and it's great for them. And let's talk about that access to the games. Obviously, the big question about the athletes, Belarusian and Russian, uh, you have consistently said that it is up to Thomas Bach and the IOC to determine where they stand and whether they will be allowed to compete. Uh, has your position changed at all? No, it's, it's still the same uh, position. Uh, to be uh, clear with you, it's first the international federations that are at the moment in position to qualify or not the athletes. And in some sports, uh, Russian athletes are um, eligible to participate in the qualification system. And then it will be up to the IOC and the IPC to decide whether or not uh, Russian and Belarusian will be uh, authorized uh, to participate in the games. And as an organizing committee, we have to respect uh, this decision. And now we are going through one of the biggest climate crises uh, with this uh, latest temperature surge throughout Europe. What precautions can you ensure for athletes participating? Yeah, of course, uh, the world of sport has to, uh, to adapt uh, to the climate change and, uh, and that's also why Paris 2024 decided to reduce by half the carbon footprint of the Games. It's, it's really important that uh, as uh, the biggest sporting event in the world, uh, we demonstrate that this is feasible to organize and deliver the Games with the same level of ambition but more sustainable because we have to contribute. And, and of course, the temperature is, is key. Um, we, we looked also what happened in the past and especially in Tokyo where the, the, the temperature was very high also with a very high level of humidity that we don't have here in, in, in Paris at, at this time. So we are very confident that the athletes will be in very good conditions next year. Now you've recently handed in your report, your progress report to the LEC. Uh, how was that received? Are you meeting your budget expectations? Uh, tell me about the quality that you can ensure. For us, it's also important uh, effectively to demonstrate that uh, the cost of the organizing committee is under control. 96% of the budget of Paris 2024 is private funded. And, and for us, it's, it's key to uh, 
demonstrate that there is a, a fantastic enthusiasm. We already have uh, uh, 24 new partners uh, since the beginning of, of this year, 23. So there is a fantastic uh, dynamic so far. Uh, we control the budget. We, we had, uh, like many organizations, uh, an over budget of 10% uh, through the, the inflation. Uh, but it's under control. We can continue to finance it by having more uh, income and uh, a new partnership. So it's great because uh, at one year to go, we still maintain the level of ambition. We are still on time and still on budget. And now many help, uh, helping hands are going to be arriving, a lot of volunteers. Uh, how far along in the process are we in terms of choosing who gets to participate as a volunteer? Again, it's fantastic for us as an organizing committee to, uh, to see the enthusiasm of, of the volunteer program. We, we received more than 300,000 uh, candidacies uh, for this program and it's, and it's great for us because definitely it's, it demonstrates also that people want to be part of it, want to contribute to the success of the games. Uh, we will have to choose only uh, 45,000 uh, volunteers in the coming months. Uh, by the end of this year, uh, we will know precisely who will be involved in, in the volunteer program and then we will uh, train with them and, and make sure that they will be also prepared and ready uh, to welcome the athletes uh, from around the world. And finally, 8th of May, that's when the flame arrives to Marseille. Uh, what is the emotion that the athletes are going to be feeling upon looking at that coming to the Eiffel Tower ultimately? I'm so looking forward to, to, to being in, on the May 8th in Marseille and, and, and watching uh, the flame coming back to France one centenary after the last edition of the Games by boat uh, from, uh, from Greece. It will be a, a fantastic image for us. It will launch the celebration of, of the Games in, uh, in the whole country. Uh, so it's great. Uh, so far we we already uh, designed the route and uh, it will be very spectacular again because France is a, is a great country. We have fantastic uh, uh, iconic images uh, like uh, the Eiffel Tower. We have in every territories uh, fantastic mountains, uh, beaches and, and, and also museums that we will uh, showcase uh, during the, the flame uh, torch relay. So, so great uh, to, to be there. Tony Estangue, I can't wait. I'm sure you can't. It's going to be an immense procedure and unprecedented. The world looking to Paris and uh, one year to go. Thanks so much for joining us here on France 24. Thank you.